A very good morning to you and welcome to the show. Karibuni sana. This is Full Circle with Joyce and my name is Joyce Omondiwahiga. As always, a pleasure to have you this Wednesday where we're going to focus in on health and wellness. Today on the show specifically, we want to talk about how to keep your spine healthy as you age as you're growing older do you know how to take care of yourself are you having those aches and pains and you've really not been able to figure what it's about we're gonna have a chiropractor in studio and he's gonna be shedding shedding rather a bit more light on that today in addition we're gonna talk about mental health screening again this continues to be a topic that we must keep discussing and uh, we're gonna have a doctor she's a psychiatrist she's also gonna be in studio talking with us about this and later on in the show we're going to talk about the abuse of over-the-counter drugs with this and so much more in store for you here is what your inspirational word is for the day it says don't wait for things to get better life will always be complicated learn to be happy right now otherwise you'll run out of time i'm gonna read that again it says don't wait for things to get better life will always be complicated learn to be happy right now otherwise you'll run out of time and i think the importance of this message this morning is really just to say treasure every moment value every moment of your life that you have life is short today we have each other tomorrow we don't today you'll have something tomorrow you won't today you'll have ability tomorrow you may not so if there's an opportunity you're chasing if there's someone you need to go and reconcile with i challenge you today to do it you know stop wasting any more time stop putting it off stop saying you're gonna do it tomorrow or next week or next month do it today whatever it is you need to do i challenge you do it today with that said we're going to get started with the show and kicking us off this morning here is retha combo with the song no more fear karibuni sana this is full circle with joy all right, guys. Well, welcome to the show again. This is Full Circle with Joyce. And today being Wednesday, we want to talk about health and wellness. And to kick off our discussions this morning, we want to talk about how to keep your spine healthy as you age. Of course, your spine is one of the most critical um, organs or muscles or <laughs> in your body. And uh, a lot of us really just don't know how to take care of it. Our, our posture is terrible. We don't lift things well, as we've talked about several times on this show. And today we have Dr. Dr. Hamisi Kote Ali, who's a chiropractor, joining me on the show. Karibu sana to Full Circle with Joyce. Thank you so much. Jenny. So today, let's talk. It, let's. I mean, this. Let's talk about how the spine is one of the most overlooked parts of our body, right? We often ignore it. Sometimes we'll feel pain, but we kind of just ignore it. We say, ah, ni maisha tu, or you know, it's just because you did something strenuous. But maybe you can tell us, as a chiropractor, why it is so important to take care. Of your spine. Thank you so much uh, for having me in the studio and um, uh, giving me an interesting topic. First of all, let's understand that the spine, if we're talking about the spine, we're talking about the skeletal system and we are looking at from the head to toe, okay? And the spine then, st what, the spine then encases uh, the, the, the spinal cord and the brain is encased in the same. So the spinal cord and the brain are one okay yeah. they are both encased in bone in the skull the, br the brain is encased and in the in the back then we have the vertebras which are the various um, bones within the back where the spinal cord goes in now spinal cord then becomes very important because the the, the um, the nerves that supply various organs within our body the nerves that uh, give information on how our body functions uh, emerge from the spine to the various organs and they get information from the brain to the organs and then from the organs back to the brain mm. uh, to the spinal cord and then to the brain for interpretation therefore uh, if we cause pressure on this cord that uh, this cord that is uh, reeling information from our organs uh, to the brain and from the brain back to the organs mm. then we end up uh, we end up finding ourselves in trouble mm -hmm. um, but um, I tend to feel that um, we we we, um, we have a lot of misunderstanding in how we look at uh, uh, in how we look at this, uh, uh, the human anatomy today, <laughs> uh, because this is not this is not uh, a true representation of a human being, mm. um, because it's not on you cannot be able just to look at the spine and ignore the other tissues or the other uh, muscles and connective tissues that um, uh, encase the spine. Okay. What we need to realize is that the spine just gives us a support, okay. you know, uh, but. 
if we look at from uh, the beginning where the spine uh, started from, we realize that span, span, uh, the spine is nothing other than um, something we call a connective tissue that has, uh, over time, when we, we, we say um, attached or rather formed like a crystal to form the framework of the spine. But if we remove sulfate from the spine, then it's nothing other than a collagen fiber. So we need to understand that the spine and, and, and the bones of the, of, of the spine and the muscles are one and the same thing. So okay. if you're going to take care of your spine and if you're going to have your spine to be healthy, then it has to be the entire you who is becoming healthy. It's okay. not just the spine. Okay. Okay. Because the spine is very delicate, though. Yeah, but it cannot work on its own. Okay. The spine cannot work on its own. The spine has to have um, a support system, and that support system includes your limbs, and also includes your muscles, includes your internal organs, and all these have to work together. So, for you to be able to take off your spine, you have to look at three things. Number one, we have to look at the structure itself, which is uh, the muscles, the ligaments, uh, the bones that form the f that form the human being. Then we need to look at how we feed, what we put in our in our body to support uh, the nourishment of this uh, this complex uh, system. Okay. And number three, we have to look at how we handle the emotional si the emotional part of, of 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 our being, because these three things they have to exist in a balance okay. and whenever that we get out of that balance then the body starts compensating and when the body starts compensating then we are prone to getting pain we are prone to getting stiffness and when we get stiffness then we, we get we lose uh, functionality of some of our joints and as a result we get pinching of nerves and as a result we start having pain okay we're gonna hold it right there dr. Hamisi because you have a, co a colleague yes. uh, who's here he's actually in a a co is it a muscular suit? Yes. Uh, please come on to set. Um, we're going to stand as we just go through this and what he has to show us uh, this morning. Uh, he's coming on to set. He's completely covered from head to toe, so someone's needing to help him onto the set. <laughs> Can you see all right? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. Okay. So all so, right. <coughs> so, so this, this is, is a suit showing the muscles. Showing how the how we normally look at uh, the human being. Okay. So we are normally shown this is how the muscles of the body are, and we all believe that uh, for you to perform a movement is that you have to have this muscle that originates from here to here. Mm -hmm. But that's not true. Why? Because the brain does not send, does not give direction. I mean, does not give specific movement, but it senses direction. Okay. okay. So as a result of that, we have another connective tissue which is underneath the skin, uh, because our body is f is formed with layers, different layers that are gliding onto each other. Mm -hmm. So we have another layer that forms underneath the skin, and that layer is this layer we call the fascia tissue, or rather the connective tissue and this tissue allows that grinding of the human body so for example if you have no injury you you have no injury you have no problem in your body you are able to get full range of motion for example let's ask, let's lift your hands up he's able to lift his hands up easily mm -hmm. but let's say um, put them down let's say uh, in his journey uh, when he was in school he sprained his ankle okay and when he sprained his ankle the fascia got uh, wrinkled like that and then let's lift the hands again Let's look at the difference. Look at the difference in terms of mm. how, uh, how, how, high. How, how high he can lift and what happens to this side. You right. tend to see there's a, there's a compensation that comes with it. Sure. Uh, and that compensation doesn't only affect, just turn around, doesn't not only affect the hand, but it will affect here. So for example, I'm gonna go back again here. Okay. I'm gonna put a tight pull there and then lift your hands. Let's look at what happens also on the spine. Okay. A lot of tension builds up in the spine. Okay. So as a result, you go to the hospital and you have an X-ray of the spine because you have lack back pain, uh, back pain, and then the diagnosis comes as you have spasms of the back. Mm. But the question is, why do you have the spasm in the back? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and the spasm is causing maybe a sciatic pain going down the leg. It is because maybe of an old injury there, mm -hmm. and that old injury could also be as a result of surgery. Maybe, Tan, maybe you have got a surgery having a baby. Mm -hmm. And you got an incision here, mm -hmm. like that. Okay, look at what happens to his posture. It okay, curves now if we ask him to walk, you can see how the body walks in a distorted manner right. over time. And as a result of that, then the back of the spine, <coughs> the back of the spine, we have these vertebras, right. which are supposed to be uh, shock absorbers of how our body moves. So they will get compressed because of this external tension right. and as a result of that extension they of course pinching of mm -hmm. the nerves uh, the nerves emerge from the back mm -hmm. and then you have a diagnosis of disc prolapse okay. or disc herniation and so that's why a lot of people, give you back mothers pain. will have yes, pregnant, I mean, pregnant mothers will have um, 
back, back pain. pain. And that's why back pain is a difficult uh, condition to treat sure. because we always go to the symptom instead of looking for why does it hurt. Okay. Yeah. So if you're doing athletics, a, sim a symptom could be, you know, a pull on your leg or somewhere on your foot. Something you're saying there's a connection there to your There's spine. a lot of, most of the back pain problems that we see are, are mechanical. It's either repetitive use, as you said about posture. Yeah. So you're used to sitting in a given posture over time. Right. As a result of that, you, your muscles tend to develop a pattern. So you may get a pattern of shortening of these muscles in the front on both sides. Mm -hmm. Then when you get that <clears throat> when you get this shortening here, look at the back turn, turn around, look at what happens to the back, mm -hmm. a lot of tension. So you end up having a change of how right your posture your looks. Back. So your back changes. When the posture changes on the back, it's going to again compress the nerves. And when it compresses the nerve, it's going to give you a backache. Okay. We, 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 you go for treatment and everybody will focus on this. Yeah. You get a relief, but it doesn't last long. Why? It's not, because it's, it's not the cause. Okay. Yes. And uh, is it true that a lot of people would sort of begin experiencing a lot of back pain in their 20s? I think we sort of see back pain as something that's older. Maybe not experiencing it, but that a lot of the issues that you're talking about, the true causes, are things that they've been carrying along from for years. So maybe it's manifesting when you're 40 or you're 50 or you're 60, but really the issue began when you were much, much younger. That's very true. Uh, a lot of problems start when we are, starts from, can start from food. For example, if you are eating uh, uh, you know, a lot of processed food and you end up messing your, your, your gut system, so you're getting bloated, you're getting a lot of uh, internal problems, again, that will stiffen uh, the fascia in, inside your organs and that wow. will cause tension you need to repeat that that if you're eating a lot of junk or processed food eventually it will affect your back it will affect your back yes why because inside inside the inside the stomach we have an, an ecosystem an ecosystem that has to maintain a balance and when you eat this high processed food then you end up destroying that ecosystem causing the body to, to form in, to get inflamed inside and when your gut gets inflamed uh, you develop something we call a leaky gut and a leaky gut is whereby <clears throat> When you eat food, some of the some of the food particles are able to go through the cell without uh, through the cell without being uh, properly processed, okay. and as a result of that, you get this inflammatory process that uh, affect your internal organs, uh, internal system. When that happens, the body goes into a protective spas, uh, into a protection. Why? Because mm. we know the the gut is the biggest um, immune system. Mm -hmm. So when the body goes into that protection, the fascia or that connective tissue kind of stiffens up. When it stiffens up, it's not gonna just affect the internal organs, but it's gonna affect the container in which it's held okay yeah. so then in terms of trying to avoid all of these conditions um, talk to us again about some of the lifestyle changes that we should be making so you've already talked about our guts you've talked about posture is there something else that we should be working towards absolutely um, it's good to it's good for someone to, to find some form of exercise that you do, uh, be it yoga, be it even skipping, be it even taking a walk. That does not only help with the muscle pain, but emotionally also helps you clear your mind, mm -hmm. you know, and help you, helps your body function in a better in a better state. Number one, number two. Um, Massage. I people don't understand the value of massage. Mm. Uh, things like massage play a critical role to help this suit keep the on nice gliding. The nice massage is not the sports ones. <laughs> it doesn't matter what massage you get, but it maintains the gliding of the suit. Okay. Because in our body we have we, ha we have a component that allows this uh, suit to glide. It's a component we call hyaluronic acid, and that helps the body to have these layers to glide. And that's why when you look at the human body, it's created in a way that it's able to move in three planes. Okay. You're able to bend forward and backward you're able to rotate and you're able to go side and side for you to be able to do that without tangling any organs then there has to be a gliding system okay. and that gliding system uh, has always to maintain that gl gliding capability all right doctor i need to i want to ask some questions here so i need to buy some time <laughs> uh, but uh, hey joyce ask doctor how the spine should be taken care of especially after a c-section another question on pregnancy hi joyce alice from gadiga i gave birth eight months ago and my back is giving me issues especially my left shoulder blade right next to the spine i'm not sure what it's called but i can't do anything because of it every time i do laundry or even just stand for long i feel like it could be serious please help so two questions there related to pregnancy um, and having given birth if you could just answer those very briefly so that i can get to two others um, you have one, when, you, when, you go, when you go through a, a surgical uh, procedure, it is important that you look for someone who knows how to take care of a scar. 
Mm. Someone who no understands how the scar needs to be taken care of. Why? We, when a scar forms, it forms and it becomes permanent the way it is. Right. However, when the scar is still fresh, you can work away from it to to um to to influence uh, the settling up of the fibers that form when the when the healing happens right. to be aligned according to the way the body pulls. Okay. So if that is not aligned, then it's gonna cause compensation, and that's why people you see she's complaining of a pain in the shoulder. Right. But I'm sure there's nothing wrong with the shoulder. The scar could be what is causing the pain. All right. Another question here. Hey Joyce, I'm Mercy watching from Uthiru. I love the show. My question is, um, does overworking cause back pain to an extent that one is not able to bend? Yes. It's again repetitive use. If you if you do a, a repetitive type of a task over a long time, what happens is that you end up overdeveloping those type of, those muscles that do that task, and then underworking the ones that are supposed to be uh, supporting you. Right. So as a result, again you develop wear and tear. Yeah. because of overload of the joint. Right, and so and that even points to how people like bend to pick up things. So instead of just hunching over, yes. use your hamstrings. You, use we your always say we always say it's always safer that whenever you want to pick something, it has to be within your center of gravity. Right. So it's important you go down right. and get the thing closer to you, and like when you reach out further. Right. Because if this suit is stiff, that's why people will tell you I went to bend because, and yeah. then I had a pop. Uh, yeah, yeah, why? It's because of that stiffness. Okay. You, you end up breaking the. Uh, the Our last final limit. question before I get in trouble here but uh <laughs> good morning joyce i'm faith watching from juja which sleeping position really helps keep the spine healthy well there is no standard sleeping position as per what i i, I get to know now but uh we don't encourage people to sleep on their tummy. Yeah. You can sleep on any other position, but we don't encourage people to sleep on their tummy. Why? Because you keep your, leg, your, your neck in a rotated position for so long, and that can cause it to spasm or cause uh, you to compress some of your, your structures, and that start causing you pain. Okay, yeah. excellent. With that said, please do let us know where we can find you. Perhaps as someone who's like, oh my goodness, perhaps I do need to go see a chiropractor. How can we find you? I see you're wearing your... Yes. Um, <laughs> We are Premier Rehab and Wellness Centers. We have two offices in Nairobi and Mombasa. And our telephone number is 0713-030-395. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Ari, for being Thank here you. today. Thank, Thank you. you to you. <laughs> 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 we're going to escort you and help you off the set. Thank uh, you so much. Oh, oh, hold on, hold on. Apparently, you're going to finish the, sh the segment with you. So, okay. <laughs> well, coming up next, <laughs> in our next segment, uh, we're going to be talking. Uh, yeah, Dr. Yamipotea. Anyway, that's oh. fine. In our next segment, we're going to be talking about mental health screening, and we're going to have a psychiatrist joining us in studio. Do you want to wave? This is like your. There we go. <laughs> Back in a bit.
trending. Let me do a sound check so you can see me. Oh, uh, Dr. Frida, committee. Count one to ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Your guess. Oh, Yango. What do you need? All right, guys. Well, welcome back to Full Circle with Joyce. And of course, uh, this morning we focus in on health and wellness. We continue with our discussions right now, switching gears just a bit to talk about mental health screening. And joining me on the show, I have Dr. Frida Kametti, who's a psychiatrist. Karibu sana to the show. Thank you. Um, Daktari. And in addition, actually, this month of May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So certainly this topic is in line with what we need to be discussing as a whole country, um, even across the globe. And so with that said, uh, let's begin, Daktari. We always talk about symptoms of mental health, but um, we don't actually talk about the screening mm -hmm. for it. Um, what does the screening entail? How often should one get it? So screening is really important, um, just the same way we screen for you know, high blood pressure, we screen for diabetes. It's imperative that we also screen for mental health. Uh, mental health. Mm -hmm. um, how often really depends on when you get sick and you feel like I'm not, my body is not feeling well, you go to a doctor so you can get screened. Um, to check if something is going on with you. So the same thing if you start feeling like I'm not myself. Um, for instance, if you know some of the symptoms of mental health, um, you can actually go to a primary care doctor mm. and you know, kind of talk about what your symptoms are and they can, uh, they can screen uh, for mental health issues right. and also screen for some symptoms depending on what you're experiencing. Right. Uh, of course, this has to be done by a professional. Sure. Um, it is actually not scary as people think. Mm. Uh, I know there's a lot of stigma involved with mental health and so a lot of people feel, am I, am I going to get screened and then people are going to think that I'm crazy. Right. So there's all this language that we use to scare people away, but it's not really difficult uh, and it's not scary. Yes, it is scary to find out you have a diagnosis, mm -hmm. but uh, early, early diagnosis is actually better because uh, early intervention helps in the process. And um, it helps an individual to actually get early treatment mm -hmm. and therefore actually reduce the amount of time that the person suffers from the symptoms. Okay. Yeah. So when you're doing diagnosis, um, what, what, what are you diagnosing? What are some of the common things that you diagnose? So for um, most of the uh, common uh, conditions that we see um, is uh, like depression. We see a lot of um, um, bipolar. We mm -hmm. see a lot of psychosis, so schizophrenia. Uh, we see a lot of substance abuse, um, people addicted to drugs and alcohol. Um, and then we also see a lot of personality disorders as well. Mm. So we're screening for, and but mostly when we're screening for all these things, the most important thing as well we're screening for is the state of well-being. Uh, both psychological, emotional, and social. We're screened for all these things. And is this individual able to adapt? Uh, are they able to act actually function? Mm. Um, and are they able to contribute uh, to the community? And so we screen for all these things so that um, the person that is going through the screening can understand what's going on with them. And if we do actually find something is going on with them, we help uh, we, we help and counsel in what kind of treatment or intervention we want to take. Okay. Do we want to do medication? Do we want to do talk therapy? And this is helpful for the patient mm. so that they know how to live with the condition they have. Okay. Yeah. Um, in, in your experience, I'd, I'd be curious to, to find out um, what are some of the things that you've seen now as you're counseling people mm -hmm. that are either big triggers or that are things that maybe our society culturally has always sort of just rubbed away, mm -hmm. but perhaps are actually 
um, significant causes mm -hmm. of mental health issues? I think I have to say that um, the stigma especially is caused by people, uh, how people talk about mental health. Mm. Um, I have patients who come and tell me, well, when I tell my people that I feel this or that, they say that I have been bewitched, that wow. witchcraft is involved. Um, or sometimes I get patients who've been str suffering for a very long time and they tell me that um, we, you know, we were praying about it. There's nothing wrong about being spiritual and praying for any condition, mental or, you know, uh, uh, medical. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, if, if, if your body is responding in a certain way and is out of balance and actually needs an intervention that is science, um, uh, from science, then you need, you do need the prayers, of course, mm -hmm. um, but you also need intervention that is actually going to help you. So there's that fear of what are people going to say if they find out mm -hmm. that I have depression? What are people going to think? So we have this thing where people want to give this positive impression um, and it always affects how people actually, you know, get care. Um, and then the other thing that I've seen is we want to sort of, um, I don't know, the expression of, you know, live like the Johnsons. Mm. So, for instance, she has a house or she just bought a new car. I also want to buy a new car. I don't know how you bought the new car. Right. I don't know how you bought the house, but I want to have that and I don't have the means. So living beyond the means actually sometimes causes that stress yeah. because I'm trying to get to where you are and my the where I am I'm not able to do that so you're actually having you have a lot of clients that come in because of they're trying to keep up with the Joneses Absolutely. they're seeing people like are living large on Instagram and you know it's probably filtered and fake for the gram absolutely but you have guys coming in because of that competition absolutely wow you you'll be surprised at uh, what social media and I love social media it's a very important tool that educates and can be can be very positive when used correctly but we have people we have young people who are very impressionable and they don't understand that what you see on there doesn't necessarily is not necessarily the reality right just it's because if, absolutely yeah. so just because you see me my, and my pictures somewhere in um in morocco you know or somewhere skiing doesn't mean that you have to do the same thing, wow. you know. So we're seeing a lot of people, of course, trying to keep up with the Joneses, which is causing a lot of stress, mm. um, which is also causing a lot of um, lifestyle changes, mm -hmm. uh, which are creating a lot of depression. And so, yes, most of the people that we're seeing are actually experiencing a lot of pressure to sort of keep up with the Johnson's. That is absolutely fascinating. And if you're watching, I'd be very curious, you know, has social pressure, I mean, has social media put that much pressure on you that perhaps even you're feeling, you know, a certain pressure and maybe you've just not really recognized it. What has social media made you think about yourself or about your family, about where you're at in this moment? I'd really love to hear from you. The SMS line is double two triple nine. You can also reach me on our Facebook page. That's at Switch TV Kenya. Give us your feedback this morning. We'd be happy to hear it. Now, Dr. Tari, um, just yesterday we were talking about emotional infidelity mm -hmm. and and one of our guests mentioned how most of the time when people go for therapy or counseling, it's usually the women. Mm -hmm. It's very rare to see men <laughs> in the counseling room unless mm -hmm. they're being dragged there by their wives, they said. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to see if you have the same experience now when dealing with mental health issues. Are you finding that it's a lot more women that are sort of open to confronting and addressing the issue or given some of the influences that you're saying keeping up with the Joneses I imagine a lot of men especially have that pressure mm -hmm. you know do you have a cool watch do you have a cool house how many women are in your life do you find a lot of men there as coming to you seeking out help or is this the same thing where is it, even with emotional and family issues we're finding it's mostly women that are speaking out uh, I have a lot of women are more open to um, seeking help um, and that's because women have um, w women tend to actually just talk 
you know, women talk to their friends, they talk to their mothers, talk yeah. to their sisters. But with men, I think the culture that we live in and the culture that we're raised in um, sort of makes men believe that you you don't talk about your problems. Yeah. You're the head of the household. You're supposed to be strong. So Have there's it together 24-7. Exactly. So there's this facade that men put on that no, I, I don't I don't have any problems. And if I actually have any problems, I'm not gonna actually talk to anyone because I'm it's gonna be seen as a sign of weakness. Mm. And that's why we are seeing that um a lot of men are um are actually resulting to very you know uh, unhealthy ways of coping a lot of um, alcoholism mm. a lot of um, drug use um, uh, a lot of violence yeah. uh, towards their spouses their partners I'd even um, be curious if more if if the statistics would show that more men than women commit suicide actually that's interesting that you should say that they do. What happens is actually men are more successful at it than women. Mm. Women tend to commit suicide more or attempt, attempt. suicide more, but men actually tend to be more successful because they plan it and they actually think about it. And when they do it, they don't, they don't tend to sort of go out there and advertise it. Yeah. Women usually have sought help, have talked to people, but not men. Mm. So yes, the, you're right about those statistics. I don't have quite the number, okay. but you're very right about the statistics. Wow. Dr. Ari, thank you so much for being here today. I think you've certainly continued. We've, we've been having this discussion since this show started mm -hmm. on mental health and its importance. And I think you're bringing out a lot. I particularly appreciate the perspective you've brought us this morning of how even just keeping up with the Joneses and trying to keep up with the Joneses mm -hmm. or your neighbor or your people on, on, on social media is actually leading people um, to a lot of mental health issues. Thank you so much for opening up with us today yeah. and uh, addressing this issue. Yeah. We, we appreciate your company. With that said, guys, we do need to take a break. But uh, when we come back, we are going to start talking about abuse of over-the-counter drugs. You know, based on what Dr. Tari Frida is saying, perhaps a lot of you, maybe the first thing you've tried to resolve to is looking for your own treatment over-the-counter, just finding prescription medicines or whatever else to try and solve your issues. And perhaps it's not working out not to talk about even what the damage it's doing to yourself, even physically. We're going to be talking about this and much more when we come back from this short break. Do stay tuned. This is Full Circle with Joyce. Do you want me to say anything about my dowager straight into general? Because we're actually an online pharmacy. Yeah. 
So we're the kind of the first ones to do the e-commerce platform. All right, guys. Well, uh, Karibuni Tana, we continue with our discussions today on health and wellness. And right now, we want to talk about the abuse of over-the-counter drugs. Okay, and joining me on the show, I have Dr. Fa Farzana Sunderji, yes, that's who's right. the head of operations <laughs> at Maidawa. Looking very beautiful, I have to say. Thank you. Karibu Trying to, you set the bar this high, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and welcome to Full Thank Circle. Thank you for having Joyce. me. So when we talk about over-the-counter drugs, what are we talking about? Because sometimes I feel like in Kenya, our regulation is a bit lax. You know what I mean? In other countries, there's no way you just go in like, like we, we self-medicate quite a bit. So when we're talking about over-the-counter drugs, is it just all-encompassing to anything you can find at a chemist? No. In actual fact, over-the-counter medication is basically something you can buy without a prescription. Mm -hmm. So it's a valid prescription from a prescriber. So say you have a headache, um, you have uh, diarrhea. You generally know you just need to take something and it will sort itself because your body itself fights itself within 72 hours. Right. So it's a short term, something that you can take just to ease the symptoms. If you have a headache, you know two paracetamol yeah. will cure your headache. Yeah. Um, so it's supposed to be sold in smaller packs just for a few days treatment. Um, unfortunately, what happens in some places, because there's no defining what is an OTC or what is a prescribed item, people end up then taking it on a long-term basis. Mm. Yeah. So going back to the question what you asked, over-the-counter is just basically something that you can, you're supposed to buy for a short-term period without yeah. a prescription. Right. If you're on a chronic medication or you need something for long-term, then you need a professional to be assessing you. Right. And that's where a, a doctor comes in who's monitoring. So if you're a hypertensive patient, yeah. um, your blood pressure needs to be checked. You know, but what seems to happen is people just keep going to the pharmacy and buying their chronic medication right. without that review, um, and that's how it, it, the, the defining needs to be there, the definition. Sure. But um, I think our regulators are working very hard to okay. create that definition, okay. um, which should then make it very easy to identify what is an over counter and what is a prescription. Right. So with a prescription medication, if you don't have a valid prescription you shouldn't be able to get the item over the counter. Mm. Yeah. And it's um, obviously, I guess, there'll, many people might challenge that for different reasons. The cost of health care, exactly. cost of insurance. <clears throat> so there's a lot of other dynamics that will exactly. come into that. Yes. But for today, let's just um, say for, for those who are just going to the, to the over the counter and just getting medicines, there are significant risks associated with that. Maybe you sure. can walk, walk us through some so of those. When Even you, something as simple as the paracetamol that you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. Um, so basically, when you walk into a pharmacy um, and you say you want something for a headache, so paracetamol, now, there could be an underlying condition. So at the moment, you're treating the symptom. Mm -hmm. You've got a headache, you want to treat the symptom. So you take the paracetamol. When you keep doing that, um, so every time you have a headache, you go get a paracetamol, you get a paracetamol. If you notice there's a trending, you're taking it all the time, then that says there's something wrong. You're treating the symptom, but not the condition. Mm. So a lot of things come across from there where you realize because you've not treated it, your condition gets worse. Right. So sometimes um, this is why if you keep going to a pharmacy, one, that's the issue that can happen. Two, your symptoms can tell you something, but without being examined by a, f a practitioner, mm. a physician, you will never know what is actually wrong with you. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you can be taking something, and if it's like the paracetamol, you may then realize because you've not got any educational health education information, why are you getting the headaches? Are you not drinking enough water? Yeah. Um, is there something with your diet? You know, certain people have, maybe it's your eyesight. Maybe you're getting the headaches because there's something wrong with your eyes. Mm. So the, the principle behind it is that when you keep going to a pharmacy and you're not getting intervention from a professional after having the symptoms for a while, that indicates that the, the symptom is being treated but the condition is not being identified. Okay. So then that leads to more complications in a person's life. Okay, so let's talk about this and let's give a practical example for like say, 
uh, we're getting into a rainy season, yep. so maybe there might be a flu or a cough, you know, sure. a cold going around. Mm -hmm. Typically, people, <laughs> it's like discussions <laughs> in the office over lunch as you're eating your, I don't know, gideri. Or if or you have kids, you, it gets even yeah. worse this season. And yeah. you, you're, so your parent friend yes. has said, yeah, you know, this medicine actually really did wonders for my child. And a lot of times that's what we end up doing, right? Yeah. We end up going to the pharmacy and looking for it. So. I'm just curious then if you're saying that we actually need to be very cautious about this because I know there's someone who's going to be like, but Joyce, just to go and see a doctor, he's going to look at me for two minutes and, and then me. charge me 2,000 bob. <laughs> and I agree with that. <laughs> Um, and that's why I'm saying, so if it's a cold and flu, yes, you know, there's certain conditions that we call minor ailments, cold, flu, which are viral within 72 hours should recover. You get a stomach bug. Um, generally, it's just something you've eaten yeah. within 72 hours. It should recover. And you can go to a pharmacy for that, you know, and if there is the, uh, uh, that's why we always say that interface between the person in the pharmacy and the patient is also very important Yeah. because at that point, what may be good for Joyce may not be good for Fazana because Fazana's got another chronic condition. Yeah. So all of a sudden what you're taking for your cough and cold may interfere with my chronic medication. Sure, sure. So sometimes people also forget that that's why we say never refer the medication or take something that someone else is recommended. Mm -hmm. Go seek a professional opinion because the person in the pharmacy is a professional. Mm -hmm. They've gone and, and understood you know, the interactions between medications, what suits one person may not suit another. Absolutely. So we generally say that if you go in and if it's a cough and cold, um, yeah, sure, three days take it. I'm not saying going to the doctor, go yeah. take it for three days. But if you find after three days you're not getting any better, absolutely go to then, the doctor. Then don't, yeah, exactly, then don't stop medicating. And you know what's happening right now? Mm. Dr. Google. Yeah. Dr. Google is everyone's best friend. Um, and that is actually a risk because it gives you all the information. So people think now they're doctors and mm. they want to save the money not going to the doctor. Mm. Short term, I fully agree. But if your symptoms don't get better, yeah. then I fully recommend people that, you know, after three days, if your child is not getting better, you wouldn't take the risk with your child. Absolutely. So why are you doing it yourself? Absolutely. Uh, guys, if you're just joining us uh, in the few minutes we have left, you can still send in your questions. The SMS line is double two triple nine. You can also comment on our Facebook page. That's at Switch TV Kenya. I'm here talking with Dr. Farzana, who's the head of operations at Maidawa, which is actually an online, uh, yes. can I call it an online pharmacy? It is an online pharmacy. Yeah, and you're yes. going to tell us a bit more about that sure. as we get ready to end the show. But there's something here. People are addicted to cough syrups. Yes, they are. You I was to that. a bit like you when I moved back to Kenya abroad, you know, codeine cough syrups were always, um, you know, not allowed to be sold because it's got codeine in it. We all know codeine is a narcotic. So mm. people get addicted to it and then all of a sudden they need to keep taking it and taking it. So it becomes an abuse. Wow. Um, and so someone is just sitting there like it's a bottle of juice, just chugging it away. Yeah, it's a freak narcotic. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. What are some of the other crazy things that you've seen there that people are, are addicted to? There are quite a few. To? I mean, our regulators now, and I have to give credit to them, have really, you know, they've taken that off. Now you can't buy codeine cough syrups without a prescription. Okay. Good. So in the time that I've moved back, I've seen changes. Okay. And I, I like I said, before the regulation is working, we are getting there, you mm -hmm. know, and it's a really positive sign. Yeah. Um, but there are other things that, uh, you know, if I start saying people start going to the pharmacy now and buying it, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, there's things like some cough syrups also have ephedrine in it, you mm -hmm. know, which gives you a high. Um, kind of like they, they mix it with alcohol. Wow. You get other drugs that when you mix it with alcohol gives you the double effect. Goodness. You know, some painkillers. Okay. So people tend to know this. Some drugs like the antihistamines that you get. Mm -hmm. If you mix that with alcohol, it gives you a double high. Right. Yeah. So there's a lot of things, but that's why I think that the pack limitation also helps. Yeah. Um, if you go and just get a smaller pack instead of getting 100 tablets, yeah. you get 20 paracetamol. Okay. Um, when you get 100 paracetamol, what happens? Easy for you to take an overdose. Yeah. And yeah. sleep medicines as well, because a lot of people really abuse those yes. too. Yes. There's a lot of um, regulation on sleep, so you shouldn't be able to buy them. Okay. You need a valid prescription to get a sleep medication. So on my dawa right now, we are very, very critical the way we handle all the things. We will not dispense anything that doesn't have a valid prescription. So let's doctor. talk about that because I, I, was, I was curious because you're an online online pharmacy. E yes. Uh, how do you then sort of strike that balance between what you're saying as far as making sure that someone has a prescription, that it's actually something that they need, the interface now that you'd have when you walk into a chemist, you know, person to person. Um, are you able to sort of uh, mimic that, you know, online? So, or how do people give you their prescriptions? So basically, 
as you know, technology has really come along. Sure. So it's an app. You just download the app. You go to www.mydawa.com. Um, it's an app. So when you have a prescription, there's two journeys. There's one for a prescription where you upload a prescription, take an image, and send it to us. Okay. We have a set of professional farm techs. So as a pharmacist, superintendent pharmacist for the company, I make sure that we have three checks where I have three professionals interacting with that prescription. The first check is when the prescription's uploaded, the farm tech checks, is it valid? Do the medications fit in line? Do they need to call the doctor at that point? Mm. Um, sometimes we get prescriptions that pa patient has been at for chronic medication for six months. They want a repeat, but at that point even I won't do it because mm. at six months they need to go back and get their sugars done or their blood pressure done. Okay. okay? So once he's checked and he says it's valid, it then goes to the next stage where now he'll put it in the patient's cart. The patient now will check out, so you can pay by M-Pesa. Um, we have some insurances on board. Okay. So once you've done that parameter of the job, it then goes to the a second section, which is the warehouse, where now physically it's taken off the shelves, the labels are put. Again, we have a professional. It's just not any random person. Yeah. It is actually a pharmacy person who knows everything about medicine that goes and gets it off the shelf, okay. puts the stickers on, and then gets the medication done. Okay. Then the third check is the person now who's packing it. Okay, so there's a guy who packs it, puts it in a bag. If it's a prescription medication, we actually deliver within four hours, within Nairobi free. Wow. Okay? So it's a free thing. We, we don't charge for it. And that person that delivers is actually a farm tech. Wow. So it's okay. a pharmacy profession that comes to the door to deliver. We've had some really good feedback where, you know, you have elderly patients, and, and I'm sure yes. your parents and my parents, and us kids go get the medication and we give it to the parents. They don't come out of the house as much. Now, when that farm tech comes home and sits with your mother and you watch that interface that happens between the farm tech and your, your, your parent, it's different when we tell them, take this this many times, they don't sure, listen. Sure. But that professional that comes to you and talks to your parent, I think that adds so much value. Sure. So much value when it comes to compliance. Excellent. So we have tried to put measures in place um, with the regulators as well, you know, to support that. Because like yourself, there's a lot that's happening that people are just going and buying. There's sure. no checks and balances. And at the end of the day, it's the normal one ain't you that's suffering. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Farzana, Absolutely for joining pleasure. us today. And uh, kudos to you and your team. Uh, we appreciate your insights here today, even just on shedding light on the abuse of over-the-counter drugs. Guys, seek a medical professional. If you've been having a homa for three days, don't try and ask your neighbor what they took <laughs> that cured them last month. Just <laughs> go and see someone. It is good for you emotionally, psychologically, physically. It's going to pay off for you. So asante sana for thank coming. Thank you so much for having me. All right, guys. With that said, we are going to get ready to wrap up the show today. And taking us to the top of the hour, we have Pitson with the song Lingala Yesu. I'll be back in just a bit to wrap up the show.